How do YouTube rabbit holes work? In particular, I'm interested in how YouTube and social media more generally influences the way we see the world, our emotions, and our general reactions. And I'm interested in understanding why social media is causing such a big rise in anxiety. So the rabbit hole, I think, is going to be one of the clues to the answer to this. How does it relate to the psychological principle of priming? And how does it relate to the concept of time traps? That's what we're exploring in this video. For this video, I'm talking about YouTube, but I think the concept of a rabbit hole is going to apply a lot more broadly to other types of social media. So first of all, what is a rabbit hole? And I would define this as a series of content that leads you to a particular endpoint, where the, the basic idea is that you would not end up watching that final endpoint unless you were led down a path that sort of gradually led you there. The example from the documentary The Social Dilemma is the flat earth videos on YouTube, where a lot of people probably would not have clicked on flat earth videos, except that YouTube had this way of leading them down that path, where first they were introduced to videos that sort of cast doubt on things that they were taught in school, and that led to other videos, which led to other videos, which eventually warmed people up to the idea that uh, the earth was flat, that people who said it was round are, are lying to you. And that's, that's kind of a crazy example, but I think there's a lot more mundane and more common examples that are going to have a big impact on regular people. Now, I think there's going to be a lot of different endpoints for rabbit holes that are useful to social media. In this video, I'm going to explore rabbit holes that lead into a time trap. So what is a time trap? A time trap is just a series of videos that sort of suck you into the platform and lead you to just spend hours watching that particular type of video. Obviously this is going to be good for the platforms because they're trying to maximize time on platform, so if they can get you into some kind of content that draws you in, that's good for them. And obviously, the kinds of things that are time traps are going to be specific to the individual. Examples of kinds of content that might lead to time traps might include sports, old TV show clips, video game channels, celebrity gossip, K-pop, things like that. You could imagine with all of those categories that once someone starts watching a few videos in that category, that they might just stay on the platform for a long time watching these over and over and over. I've certainly done that, and you probably have too in some category. If we're thinking from the platform's perspective, we might imagine the platform's primary goal is to optimize time on platform, but its secondary goal might be to get you into one of these types of content that tend to suck you in. It doesn't just want you going on there and looking up how to fix a toilet, it wants you going on there with the intention of looking up how to fix a toilet and watching a series of videos that sort of lead you into one of these time traps. That's its, that's its secondary goal at least. Alright, if I want to think through how does this happen, what are the psychological mechanisms that the algorithm might figure out to lead us down a rabbit hole, I want to think about the concept of priming from psychology and behavioral economics. But first, I think it helps to have an example to work with. So here's an example that happened to me recently. To keep things simple, I'm going to use a three video rabbit hole, but obviously many of these rabbit holes are going to be whole series of videos where you watch many in one category, which lead you to many in another category. So th these rabbit holes are probably longer than three videos, but I think you'll get the point with this series. Recently, I watched a video on death masks which showed the death masks of famous people like Benjamin Franklin, and it was really cool. That was from a channel called Mystery Scoop. And the next time I went onto platform, it showed me, among many other things, another Mystery Scoop video. And it was just one video from that channel. But since I'd had a great experience with the death masks video, of course I clicked on the Mystery Scoop video, which happened to be a celebrity couples video. It was about what celebrity couples have lasted the longest. 
So I watched that video and of course it's, it's showing me lots of celebrities and one of the celebrities was Michael J. Fox and his wife Tracy Pollan. And I didn't know who his wife was. I barely remember Michael J. Fox being on TV, but seeing them as a couple and seeing that they met on set made me curious about the TV show they met on. So of course when YouTube showed me clips of Michael J. Fox and his wife on set back in the 1980s where they met, I had to click on that next video. So three part video, and of course once you're watching old TV shows, a lot of people get hooked into old TV shows. Now I wouldn't get hooked into that one because it wasn't part of my growing up, that was a little before my time, but if it had been a series on Friends or The Office, I definitely would have gotten hooked in a time trap. All right, so we want to figure out how the algorithm's brain is working. And the algorithm has a goal of getting me to watch a bunch of old TV show clips. That's its secondary goal. Its primary goal is to keep me on platform, but it knows that I tend to get hooked in when it comes to old TV show clips. So if it wants to do that, it might notice that after someone watches the celebrity couple's video, they have a much higher percent chance of clicking on a video from old TV shows. Now, the algorithm doesn't know why that is, but obviously the reason is it's showing celebrity couples, it's reminding us how they met, and many of those couples met on TV shows. So it doesn't know that, but as I'm watching this video, I'm getting curious about those old TV shows. That's what's going on in my head. So the algorithm says it would be great if we could get her to watch the celebrity couple's video. The problem is that's not a type of content that I generally watch. So it wants to get me to watch that because that increases the chance of me going down a rabbit hole, but I wouldn't naturally watch that. So its next question, this is again thinking from the algorithm's perspective, its next question is how can I get her to watch the celebrity couple's video? And it knows that if I have a really good experience with a video from a particular channel, that I'm much more likely to click on another video from that channel because I see the branding, I see, ooh, I want another experience, like the great experience I just had. So it knows me, so it kind of knows that a death mask video is the exact kind of video that I would love to watch. It shows me the death mask video from the channel that also has a celebrity couples video and therefore it's sort of sending me down the pathway of the rabbit hole. Now I should say that this this is not deterministic. It doesn't know for sure that I'll click on the celebrity couples if I watch the death mask video. All it knows is that I have a higher probability of clicking on the second one after enjoying the first one. And maybe that's just a 10% higher probability, maybe it's not even that high. But in a lot of ways, these algorithms are working with small percentages to try to nudge us towards rabbit holes. And there's a lot of uncertainty there. It depends on my mood, it depends on the other content I've watched recently. It's just trying to work the system to increase the chances that I will follow the many pathways it has that end up in old TV show clips, because that is a time trap. Okay, so how does that relate to priming? Well, first of all, what is the concept of priming to begin with? And chapter four from Thinking Fast and Slow has some really great ways of explaining it. One of the classic examples is that psychologists have had people solve these puzzles. So one of the puzzles is S-O blank P and it asks people, what is the letter in the blank? Come up with a word. So two possible words they could come up with are soap or soup. And if you've been talking about washing recently or if they've even seen the word wash, they're much more likely to complete that puzzle with soap. If they've seen the word eat, they're much more likely to complete that puzzle with the word soup. That's a fairly simple concept, but it's been proven over and over again that when people encounter words in one category, they're much more likely to easily recall words that are related to that. So this is, it's all about nudging the brain to be more likely to move in certain directions rather than other directions. That's the concept of priming. Now priming is going to be key to understanding how rabbit holes work. 
That's because as we watch these videos, there are going to be certain things our brains are primed to think about. And I like to think of rabbit holes as curiosity holes. Some people will describe the brain as a puppy, where it gets interested in one thing and then it gets interested in another thing, and it has a short attention span and will be called to new things as they raise the puppy's curiosity. So if you watch a celebrity couple's video, there's going to be a lot of points of curiosity throughout the whole video. What was the TV show those people met on? What kind of gala did, th did that couple meet at? I wonder what that couple's kids look like. There's so many questions that might pop up in your head as you're watching that video. Your, your brain's just sort of, you know, running through a whole bunch of things. And for each of those questions that tend to pop up in people's minds as they watch the video, there's probably going to be other content on YouTube that, that fulfills that curiosity. And so having watched the celebrity couple video, you're much more likely to watch a whole slew of videos that have a little tiny relation to something mentioned in that video. In which case, the algorithm can say, of the many, many questions that tend to pop into people's minds, which one of those is most useful to nudge people toward the time trap? And of course, the algorithm doesn't think quite like that. It thinks in probabilities. It basically says, after watching a celebrity's video, here are the 200 videos that people have a higher probability of clicking on. And let's just say all 200 videos lead to a 10% increase in the probability that you'll click. Which of the 200 videos is most likely to lead to a time trap? And with the celebrity couples and with me and knowing that I sometimes get trapped in friends videos and office videos, it's going to say, well, we want to lead her toward a TV show because that tends to be her time trap. That, in a nutshell, is how rabbit holes on YouTube work. Now, I think these are going to be really important for us understanding some of these phenomenon that I'm worried about. Um, in particular, it's not just time on platform that these algorithms are trying to optimize. They're also trying to optimize engagement and clicks on advertisements. And I do believe that a state of threat is associated with a higher probability of actually engaging. That sort of taps into the fight or flight response. And it's that sense of threat that I think it has figured out. Content that heightens that sense of threat will achieve the algorithm's goals. So if it can find rabbit holes that lead people towards a sense of threat, that's going to achieve some of the goals of engagement and clicks in ways that I don't think we first saw when we gave the algorithms these simple tasks like increasing time on platform and increasing clicks. So that's just an overview of rabbit holes and how they work generally. And I think it'll help us to start thinking about why is society going so crazy? <laughs>